Oh, good afternoon. This is always the tough spot straight after lunch, but thank you for coming in. Um, my name's Mike Ellis. Um, I'm British, but I work for the Hollywood guys, so I often say I will talk and hopefully Hollywood will listen. Sometimes they do. Um, a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about who the MPA is, and the convergence that we're seeing, the content protection, and the issues that we're facing in China, and then how we're engaging with local industry, and why that is absolutely critical um, as we move our agenda forward. For those of you who are not aware, the MPA was formed and founded in 1922, um, ostensibly to stop the US government getting involved in our film industry, um, particularly in light of censorship issues. And in 1945, we expanded to cover the international marketplace with an association called the Motion Picture Association. It's pretty much one and the same. And in America, we go under MPAA, but globally, we go under MPA. Um, offices really throughout the world in terms of corporate regional hubs, um, two in the States, down in Mexico, Sao Paulo, and then across covering Europe and Africa is in Brussels, um, Toronto in Canada, and here, Singapore, we cover from here all the way across to Pakistan, um, and then down south all the way through to Australia and New Zealand. So a pretty broad reach. Um, in each country I have, or major country, I have an office. Um, I have staff in that office who represent uh, the interests of the Motion Picture Association and by default our member companies. Um, and I would say probably the next country that we're looking at where we need to be is across in Vietnam. Um, I think all of you will be aware who the major Hollywood studios are. There they used to be seven, we're now down to six. Um, and I'm sure that all of you are very, very familiar with the content that they, that they release. Um, certainly, coming into the summer blockbuster season, you will see tentpole after tentpole being released. Let me give you a run through of some of the content that we have. Will you come with me on this adventure? All right, then. Your journey begins now. So what have you come to see? Surprise me. This autumn, we've got action. Great. Drama. This is our time. Comedy. You're kidding, right? <laughs> this is an experience that just can't be beat. Hold on! With so many great new releases, you're in for a treat. Just when you think there couldn't be any more cool things, a new thing comes out. <laughs> You're funny. This is a place beyond imagination. We could be heroes. Where your pulse will race. Right, go! You'll cheer in celebration. <laughs> for adventures that are inspirational. I have something worth living for. Incredible. <laughs> Irresistible. I'll never do that again. <laughs> and stories that are unrivaled. Unforgettable. Unmissable. And that be something. If you love movies, then you can't go wrong. <laughs> See them here first, on the big screen, where they belong. That's just perfect. The content you've seen there are the films that were released in the autumn. That represents billions of US dollars worth of content and marketing to get that product to the screen. Now, the screen, obviously, theatrical release is the premier opportunity we have to release that product, but it represents just a small proportion of the revenue that can be driven off that content. And so the long-tail delivery, um, traditionally um, on TV or pay-on-demand or um, increasingly coming online on the internet and through digital means, is going to become a critical part of how we recoup our investments from the billions of dollars that is released. And, um, I think an earlier speaker talked about there's only going to be geeks and artists. No, there's not. There's always going to be big studios who are going to have to invest a lot of money to make content. The average cost the last time we looked at this in 2007 was 106 million US dollars to make um, a major Hollywood feature film. And the, the real key figure here is only six out of ten movies will ever recoup their original investment. So the big movies and how you maximize that revenue is absolutely critical. So if you look at more recent um, content, you know, an avatar, uh, the, the actual cost to make that and market that was just over 400 million US dollars. Um, and then more recently, Pirates of the Caribbean 4, um, knocking on close to 400 million US dollars. And in the theatrical release, only one in 10 movies will make a profit. 
So the flow through of how we deliver that content to the, um, the users in all forms of medium is absolutely critical um, to the Hollywood business. A little bit different in other marketplaces like China um, and Indonesia and Malaysia and places like that. But in the, in the Hollywood context, um, that flow through is absolutely critical. And so therefore, protecting your content and back catalog for the next 50, 70 years um, is a very important strategic business and endeavor. In terms of the MPA, we, we have sort of two things that we really do. On one side, it's advocacy, really looking about how we get market access, trying to make sure there's a level playing field, making sure we don't get hit with um, taxation issues that just make it um, unprofitable to do business, and then looking really at copyright and free expression. Um, again, delicate areas, but you know, we believe that there should be artistic freedom in making and releasing your content. And on the other side, content protection. Um, something which often we're more traditionally known for, you know, is how we deal with the, the content theft. And increasingly, um, you know, I'm spending, and my teams are now spending 80% of their time dealing with the online theft. Although there is a bit of convergence as you look um, at illegal camcording and how that gets up onto the internet. Um, and then we're looking at also, you know, reducing the manufacturing and sale of counterfeit hard goods, which again can be distributed through um, the internet. So you have an online distribution model that, at the end of the day, you receive a physical good. Um, now, in terms of convergence, uh, this is an industry that has been through immense change um, over the last century. And if you look back to the first TV in 1928 and how that TV set has changed from 48 through to 68, and I still remember uh, 66 watching the World Cup on TV in black and white with my parents. I'm, yeah, I'm that old. Um, and obviously the bigger screen 88 where you had the backlits coming through and now high definition TV, v, TV and who knows where that TV will end up. All I know is that every time I buy a TV, it's bigger, it's better and it's often cheaper than the previous one that I bought. And that um, you know, is terrific in terms of in-home entertainment. Um, and I heard earlier the speaker say, well, there'll only be two th ways that you'll watch a movie. One will be in the theater. I actually do believe the theatre will continue to grow and be strong for our industry because that's how we launch the marketing. But also, the other speaker talked about just on mobile. I don't agree. I think the in-home experience will come down to who that person is watching it in the home, um, and they will get the best TV screen or screen they can. So if it's you know a student, it could well be in his room on his iPad watching it. But if it's downstairs and it's the parents, you know it'll be on that 50, 60 inch TV that sat on the wall. So I think in-home entertainment is probably the key word, um, and that will be on many, many different types of devices. And I think then in terms of convergence, that's the, the critical part as to how you can acquire your content um, and be able to make it interoperable. Um, There's nothing more frustrating than buying a piece of equipment, plugging it in at home, and finding that it just doesn't work. Um, I think all of us have had the experience of battery chargers, um, in particular, you know, with the iPad, I plugged in my charger the other day and it wouldn't work and there's nothing more frustrating than that. In the home, when you're having all these multiple devices, getting them to work correctly together and protecting the content is going to be one of the most critical things um, that we have to continue to work on. And it's not straightforward. Um, and, you know, we work very closely with various entities. Um, Casbo were here earlier, obviously a very important ally of ours. Uh, the Center for Content Promotion, another um, critical ally with Issa So, who was up here earlier, talking about just those issues. And I think that in particular um, is an area that um, all of industry, not just the creators of content, but also the manufacturers of equipment, are going to be working on very closely. Now, if you look at convergence, um, you look you know, where analog has gone digital, and now we're going through to the internet, and you look at the cable, satellite, uh, the telcos getting more involved, certainly in America, with ATT and Verizon, and you will increasingly see that occurring in other parts of the world as well, um, as commercial negotiations take place, and the telcos realize that um, they need to be in this space and helping us um, deliver the content, and uh, what will be good news for me is helping protect that content. And then if you look at over-the-top TV, uh, the models that are coming through, not only in America with Netflix and Hulu, but increasingly in China, uh, where you're seeing them driving a new market that just wasn't there before, that is already overtaking the physical world. Um, luckily, not the theatrical world, but the physical world. And if you look at places like Korea, 
um, obviously one of the most wired places. Um, there's some amazing things taking place with IPTV there, and the number of channels and the interoperability of those channels. Um, I was there the other day looking at a particular uh, boy band, uh, or was it a girl band, one of, one of them, I'm not quite sure which it was. Uh, but you could actually focus on an individual singer in that band and watch the whole show following that singer on the stage. And with some of those Korean bands having a, um, over you know, 10 performers, and if not more, when you take them overseas, um, that, again, is a ter terrific convergence of how TV and camera work can, can be worked with um, an IPTV type of format. Um, in terms of consumer trend, um, in the old days, you know, arrogantly, we would tell people where you could watch your content, when you could watch it, and pretty much what you're going to pay for it. That's changed. Increasingly, the consumer is telling us how they want to watch their content, where they want to want, where they're, where they're going to watch their content. Um, and the more important thing is, majority of consumers will pay for that content if they can pay. And um, earlier with uh, John Madeira talking about the frustrations of using an American credit card to try and get content overseas and the difficulties of some online providers not making content available, I think, you know, as content owners, absolutely we have a responsibility to make that content available to the majority of the consumers who want to pay for it. Um, and if we don't, then unfortunately there will be a large percentage that will find it through other means. Um, but it's not straightforward. Licensing rights um, and how we release our product um, you know, is, is not straightforward. And the, the lady from uh, Turner referred to the size of the contract, and you could take a look. I've seen some of those contracts, and uh, they're a real page turner. Um, in terms of online video distribution, that really is the next wave. You know, I remember back in, in the 70s when um, the video cassette and the shops were opening up, and you could go and rent your video, and you kept it for a night, and if you kept it for two, or three, you were paying the price of the video. That's all changing. Um, clearly, the, the studios are creating and we're getting our products out there, but we're seeing more independent um, studios also following a similar distribution model. And we're seeing these new um, online distribution models come through, not just the big Netflix, but you know, the UGCs and the, the hybrids of UGCs, um, such as we've seen in China, and I'll touch on that in, 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 a, in a moment. Um, but also increasingly, uh, and I guess this is what the other speakers are referring to, the mobile phone, a mobile unit or a mobile iPad. Um, ultimately, the smallest type of device you're ever going to be able to watch TV programming on. But I, I, in my view, that's the extreme part of it. It's somewhere in the middle where you're going to be watching that, whether it's your mobile connected back through a TV or back through your laptop. I think um, everybody, wherever you are, will want the best viewing experience for whatever activity you're doing. So, you know, if you are online and you're social networking, you may be able to live with a three-inch by three-inch picture in the corner, catching the latest movie so you can actually communicate with your friends about it. But if you're at home and you have the ability to link your mobile back through to the TV in your bedroom that's a 50-inch, put it back through your stereo system, you know, I, I think you're going to go for that option if that's going to be your focus just to do one, one task. Um, and increasingly, we're finding in the film industry, you know, in Japan, we were entering a problem where um, the attendance was going down in the, the demographic of around the, the 17, 16 to 23 year old. And one of the reasons was, was that they were involved on social networks on their mobile phone. And if they went to watch a movie for two hours or two hours 15, they were virtually being ostracized by their community. Um, and so increasingly, um, there are some shows coming through where you can actually communicate throughout the show. And obviously, our concerns would be camcording. Um, the platforms that we're seeing coming through there, Netflix I talked about, I'll flick onto that in a minute, Hulu, uh, amazing site in America, um, Amazon coming into play, um, Apple um, obviously also coming into play, although not obviously in every market in Asia. And what for me is um, a terrific story, um, uh, Google and, and YouTube's coming out with a rental, and they're not renting um, geeky type movies, they're renting quality made movies by major studios because at the end of the day that's what consumers will pay for, they want to pay for quality. So in terms of Hulu and Hulu Plus, I mean I think many of you will be aware of um, this particular company, um, a company that was invested in by News Corp, Disney, NBCU, um, also in cooperation with Warner Brothers and Sony, an amazing site that grew 90% in terms of revenue Q1 uh, 211 over 210 
um, and, in, and, and, and we will continue, I believe, to see that grow. Now, the initial offerings were basically, uh, and, and Macy Leong talked about, you know, free. Well, it's not free. Somebody is sponsoring you to watch that. And that was the original model. Uh, and then based off that, they've now developed um, a different model, which is available if you, if you want to pay, and then it's advertisement free. Um, and so it's basically a premium online model that you can look at, a Hulu um, uh, Plus. And that, again, is increasingly becoming available, not just on your TV, but also being enabled so you can operate it through your mobile phone or your, your, your iTouch or your iPad. Um, so giving, again, the consumer a multiple viewing opportunity through one cost. And again, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, you know, again, as a consumer, when I buy um, The Economist, the fact that I can also watch it, or sorry, not watch it, but read it on my iPad um, is an added feature that I want. I'm only going to read it once, but the fact that I can choose which medium I read it in is something that I value as a consumer. So I think that is going to, again, be an important trend. Pay once, watch in many different formats. Critical part, protecting it. Uh, Netflix, an amazing company. I was watching um, uh, the, the revenue growth of this company and the share value. I wish I'd invested in it a few years ago. Uh, the last 12 months in particular have been just astronomical in terms of their growth. Um, 20 million uh, subscribers as of April 2011, uh, now launched in Canada. And the latest offering they have is an online distribution model. And I believe I caught the news the other day um, that the online distribution is now surpassing the distribution of illegal content um, in America. Um, so again, offering something at a fair price that the consumer wants in the format he wants it um, is clearly something that will appeal to the majority of people who will be willing to pay. Now, in terms of China, um, I spend um, probably the majority of my time up and down to China almost every single month. Um, and I have seen immense change in the 13 years that I've been um, dealing in and um, working for the Motion Picture Association. I think you're familiar with the big numbers, but you know, the key one is 457 million internet users. Um, you know, an unbelievable uh, opportunity to reach your consumer. Um, and what we're seeing, unfortunately, is those consumers are finding our content from taking uh, movies off uh, off a theatrical release by camcording it. Um, we're seeing the convergence of hard goods theft and online content theft. And China, you know, because of the size of that internet population, um, is causing us immense problems with redistribution of that content. But that's not to say we don't have the same problem in America, in Canada, in the UK. Um, we do have those problems. Um, but China right now is a major focus for us because of that level of users, the impact it can have on the rest of the world is pretty much um, devastating. So we have two real, well, I actually have many challenges in China, um, but the two real ones in terms of content protection is the online problem, um, dealing with illegal content online, and the retail physical side of it. Um, but I'm hearing more and more anecdotal stories of the illegal retail side complaining that the internet illegal activity is destroying their business, and you have to smile at the irony of that. But the main problem I face in China addressing content theft um, is the fact we can't legitimately get our products into the marketplace. 20 revenue sharing films a year for the whole of the international marketplace. Um, and obviously, the Hollywood films tend to do better than the films from Germany or, or, or Italy or um, the films from around Asia. Um, but if you can't get your product legitimately into a marketplace, then your customer who wants your product, especially when you're advertising it globally, and they have access to that globally, you're going to have a frustrated consumer who unfortunately will find it through other means. So how are we going about addressing this in, in China? Um, on the earlier panel, Vobil was here, uh, I think with Yan Bing, talking about the filtering they're doing, um, terrific advanced work. Uh, we're also working with the online um, sites to limit the length of upload content. Um, and that's not unique to China. That happens in America and elsewhere. We're looking at automated removal of infringing content. Um, again, the moment a camcord is up there, if we can't get it down, that can go viral within minutes, and then we've lost that content, and without question, lost a major so uh, source of our revenue. Uh, we're looking at takedown tools so we can access through a back door uh, the illegal content and flag it for removal, um, and building a trusting working relationship with the UGCs. We're also seeing, um, you know, and I've been you know, uh, a big critic of China, I spend a lot of time there, 
but we're seeing a fundamental shift right now in the way that the government is approaching some of the online problems. And that may not just be because of content theft, but we're seeing right now a major cleanup. Um, the saying used to be another year, another campaign, but this is the most intense campaign I've seen, and it's been extended. Um, and hopefully it will be extended again. We're also seeing major investors come into the marketplace. You know, when you see um, a site like uh, PP, um, PP Live um, get investments of a larger amount through a private placement than uh, a UCO can raise for an IPO in New York, uh, sorry, a UCO can raise for an IPO, um, you know that this is the place where there's going to be immense uh, revenue to be generated down the road from legitimate content. Um, and as companies go to IPO, we're finding their willingness to clean up their act and invest in a distribution model that will earn revenue um, is coming to the fore. And that's not just on the movie side. We're now starting to see that a little bit on the music side, although a, a little bit of a tougher gig uh, without question. We're also seeing people willing to partner, certainly with us more, certainly with our studios, to address that. We're seeing Chinese legitimate companies, um, a company like Sohu.com, um, NASDAQ listed, has formed an alliance of, of copyright holders to fight piracy online. Now, obviously, a, a strategic positioning to make sure they take out the opposition who are doing illegal activities. But the fact is, they were able to amass 123 local companies with a common aim. Um, and then we're looking at putting in place some general rules and principles that were a lot of voluntary, like the UGC principles, that talks about takedown and filtering and the type of content that will be up there. Um, and we're seeing increasingly UGC sites in China willing to engage and participate in that and make a, a, a real fundamental shift in how they go about doing their business. So uh, going back three years ago, I, I put in a, an MOU with companies like Yuko, 56com Tudo, um, and we've worked collaboratively, collaboratively with them to make sure that we um, help them build their business in a way that is and supportive of how we release our content. Um, and now we're seeing new players come through, you know, Sohu.com, um, Alert TV, uh, Perfect World. All these new companies are coming through with a desire to have um, legitimate content, to buy legitimate content, and to release that off the back of marketing, uh, advertising, or ultimately, no doubt, pay a pay-per-view type of model, uh, but no doubt at a lower rate than you're seeing elsewhere but with over 400 million users, those numbers and multipliers can very, very quickly work. Um, we're also seeing a stronger role coming in from the government. Um, I think that really is critical. You know, we've always said, if you look at the Olympics, uh, and again, Yan Bing of Obil talked about the fact that they protected the Olympics. The Olympics wasn't, uh, wasn't stolen, it wasn't distributed illegally worldwide. Why? The government was involved. They can make the difference. They can make the change. Um, and we're seeing um, more and more that the NCA's campaigns are having a little bit more teeth. And I think, again, that, um, that government involvement is critical. Legitimate business underneath that is critical as well. Um, I, I brought with me my iPad. I'm not actually not, on, not completely online with it. Uh, but I was looking at Yuko's site. Um, which is available in China. They have TV series here with over 300 million unique accesses. You know, 300 million people watching a legitimate TV show that Yuku have paid for and are distributing online. And it's that type of business um, connection and investment and outreach to their consumer who are very, lo very loyal to the sites that have legitimate content and the content they want that we will see this market continue uh, to improve and grow and revenue opportunities will be there for all legitimate content holders. Um, we're seeing in terms of our studios more alignment with these companies. You know, KU6 and the Sony and Warner lineup back in 2010. Um, you know, releasing of movies online. Yuku and Warner with streaming of Inception. Um, again, that is a, a product that the consumer wants. Interestingly, uh, Inception did um, internationally, um, America obviously number one, but internationally, China was the number one marketplace in the world for that content. There is a huge demand for our content. Um, and I think, again, these legitimate sites are starting to discover that if they tap in that legitimate demand for quality content that they own and link it in with advertising revenue, they're starting to have a business that can turn a profit down the road. 
Um, and then Tudo also coming in with, um, with a Disney relationship in relation to TV products as well. And right now, TV products uh, driving uh, the online distribution more so than theatrical releases. Um, again, a huge demand for TV and limited dis legitimate distribution. And right now, um, the internet companies are able to deliver those TV contents often within uh, 48 hours of it being released in America. And so again, giving the consumer something they're aware about very, very quickly. Um, we do have, obviously, continued problems. You know, um, the search engines like Baidu and Goku uh, can still easily locate infringing content. Uh, we're working on that. We've got hybrid problems of a P2P download combined with a streaming. Um, and so we have to work on that. And the internet TV devices that are actually illegal, plug it in your TV and everything gets streamed, um, are also an emerging problem for us to look at. Um, but the good news is that you know, new initiatives are coming through, and I think that's the most exciting thing. You know, studios, both local and international, are trying different release patterns. And I know that's a very sensitive issue in America, um, but if you look at Hot Summer Days, a Fox and Y.E. Brothers co-production, um, you know, they did a theatrical release, then within a month, they did a DVD release. You know, that's not the window we have in America and elsewhere. And an online release within seven days after the DVD. You will see this model change in the very near future, in particular with local content, who will close down, I believe, that window and go very, very quickly to an online model to improve relationships. One of the things that we have um, been very, very active in doing is engaging with local industry, um, trying to find alignment, copyright protection, um, is clearly one that we believe is an easy one, um, illegal camcording, but equally just finding areas in every single country, but China in particular, where we can work together um, to build initiatives. So attending film festivals, doing um, panel discussions about co-productions, um, looking at financing, um, trying to figure out how um, we can fit in as obviously a, a, le a leader in terms of content protection, but working with local industry to satisfy their needs and impart knowledge on them. And one of the things that we've been doing is running film workshops. Um, I hasten to add these are more independent style where we bring in independent producers that are more aligned with how some of the, the studios and individuals are making their content in China. Uh, with the latest one we'll be running is in 2011. Um, one of the winners uh, of a competition we ran, of a screenwriting competition, um, she went on um, a teacher at Beijing Film Academy, uh, Zhao Zhao Lu, uh, Zhu Zhao Lu. Um, she went on, her film opened uh, the Shanghai International Film Festival last year. And in fact, Jet Li um, starred in her film, his first serious acting role, and he started in for, for, for free. Um, he was so impressed with the storyline and he wanted to be engaged. Um, and again, that type of person um, speaking out about the need for content and making sure they get a return is going to be critical for us. Um, and in furtherance of that, um, we have aligned ourselves with the Asia Pacific uh, Film, Film Academy and the awards. Um, and just last year, we created a film fund of 100,000 US dollars uh, for treatments. And we run a competition every year where there are four prizes of 25,000 US dollars um, that go out to winners to help them develop their treatment into films. Um, delighted to say one of the first films that we backed actually won uh, the, the Golden Bear at the Berlin Film Festival, one of the most prestigious awards um, in the world. And that film was then actually picked up by Sony for international distribution. Um, so our engagement uh, with initiatives like that where we can help build an industry and recognize that yes, we are competitive. The studios are competitive. Um, and we are competitive with local industry. But the more legitimate content we can get there to the consumer in a way they get used to paying, the better off all of us will, will be. Um, and it warms my heart when I see headlines that talk about um, local industry talking out about the need to protect their content. Where, um, when Zhang Yimo and Feng Xiaogong uh, are pushing the Chinese government to deal with piracy and crack down, that has a much bigger impact than myself representing the Motion Picture Association. Um, and so I think, you know, as we look towards China, we are seeing um, an immense growth in that market. Last year, um, the theatrical revenues grew 63.9%. And if I take it back to where the, the, the studio's revenues are, our theatrical revenues um, last year were 31 billion US dollars, of which 10 billion 
uh, came from America. So the international marketplace is critical. And the increase that we saw, uh, which was around, um, I believe, 11%, 13% came from uh, Europe, 21% from Asia. But of our growth in Asia, 40% of that came from China. And the numbers that you're seeing this year in China is around uh, six screens are being added every single day. So you will continue to see that growth, um, even though uh, we can only get 20 revenue sharing films in there a year. Um, and if you look at the per capita attendance at theaters, um, in America, we're running uh, just under four. Um, in Singapore, it's 4.5. In China, it's 0 0.3. So there is an immense opportunity to grow that market for the content that we, we create. So this is some of the things that we've got coming up. I don't know if I can do this. This is why you were chosen. You cannot believe what we're saying. Ready? Yeah. And action! This year, visit the summer's hottest destination. You ready for this? Let's find out. It's a place to find adventure. Fall in love. How are we going to kiss now? What? Follow your dreams. Discover Ow. friendly locals. We need to talk. Uh oh. Talking to me? I think so. Strange customs. That's an alien rock believer. <laughs> Exotic thrills. Awesome. I know, right? And experience amazing sights. Oh my god. Wow. That are inspirational. Unmissable. Unforgettable. Take the journey and live it all on the big screen. Yeah, but you're milking it. Don't milk it. Escape to an incredible summer of cinema. And visit the place that's like no place on Earth. As I said at the beginning, that represents billions of dollars worth of investment. As my former chairman of the Motion Picture Association, Jack Valenti, said, if you don't protect what you own, you will own nothing. I thank you for the opportunity, and I thank you for listening to me today. Thank you very much.